lifestyle to what you did while you were in training, for a few years at least, you can get yourself on a really good track. Or are we going to try and lower our interest rate a little bit by refinancing through a private lender? Uh, welcome back, everyone, to Financial Clarity for Doctors. I'm Rochelle Vander Vanden here with Corey Dana. Hey there. Hey. And today we have a very timely episode. It is that time of year where everyone is switching from one academic year to the next. And for a lot of you, that might mean that you're finishing up and maybe taking your first job out of training. So today we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what that transition looks like for a lot of people and some things that you can focus on to make it move a little bit more smoothly and make sure that you're doing everything you can to secure your financial future. We care a lot about what your finances look like right now, but we also care about what it's gonna look like for you 30 years from now when maybe you don't have to work anymore. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And Corey's going to get us started a little bit with some some goals and some priority setting. Yes. And yeah, this is really a big opportunity for all of you um, when you're transitioning from residency or fellowship into practice, because this is, this is when you can set the stage for future success. You know, in reality, I wish we could go back all the way to like middle school or high school when money first started becoming a thing for you and you... You have to decide if you're gonna spend your money on on a lunch out with friends or a movie ticket. Um, you know, and, and trying to make those decisions and, and ingraining smart habits uh, in your brain then. But but this is really like the last big opportunity for you to set the stage right, and it's important that we do so because you know people that that get started off on the wrong foot, it's really difficult to get back on the right foot. But if you can start with good habits from day one when you get into practice. Um, it, it's going to make your long-term financial picture so much better, so much easier, and, uh, and you'll hopefully be able to achieve the important financial goals that you have. And I think that's really a big theme of all this stuff. You've probably heard us talk about it before, but prioritizing your goals. And I think that's probably the first thing we should really focus on is talking about what's important to you, what do you want to accomplish, what's maybe not quite as important. Um, you're not going to be able to accomplish everything that you want in the time frame that you want it. Your time and money are limited resources. So we really need to decide what's most important, what do we want to shoot for, and what are we okay with maybe putting off a little bit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the thing is, is that you can't do everything all at once. So I think coming up with a good game plan and a good order of operations is really important. Because the second you start getting that bigger paycheck, it feels like you can do it all. And you can't. <laughs> I mean, not, no one can do it all at once. So just try to get a good game plan in place. And we're going to try to help you do that this episode, for sure. Yeah, so really reverse your life around achieving those long-term and, I guess, short-term goals that you have, what's most important. And we'll talk about this stuff, like Rochelle said, but you know, how important is paying off the student loans quickly? How important is getting that nice house? How important is being able to retire at a certain age, pay for your kids to go to college, having the vacation home, um, the golf club membership, you know, taking you know, fancy vacations, driving the nice car? What's most important to you? And how can we structure our life and our finances in order to achieve that? Um, and I was thinking a little bit before this for some, for some examples, and you know, probably the you know the best example I could think of just for my own life is going back um, you know, to when I was in high school playing sports, and you know I I, I was playing year round in, in various sports, you know, but but it quickly became apparent that I, I couldn't be a great student. Uh, a great lacrosse player, a great basketball player, a great golfer, a great soccer player, um, and you know, be able to to excel in every single one of those. So it, it ultimately started narrowing down, and, and lacrosse was my primary sport by the time I was done with high school, and you know, that's where I probably put the most energy and effort in the off season, practicing that one, and let some of the others slip aside. I think I, I, I realized that you know my genetic makeup being a, a you know, sub six foot person, basketball probably wasn't the, the area to focus on, you know, as, as much as I love playing it. So, um, but, you know, and, and grades too were obviously important. So, you know, focus my energy on, on school and, and lacrosse and, you know, I was able to be pretty successful in both of those and some of the other stuff wasn't as successful at. Um, but that that's okay. You know, I can live with that because I've figured out what's most important to me and put my mind to that. Our finances are no different. What's most important to you 
put your resources towards those, come up with a systematic, diligent plan to put your a percentage of each paycheck, a, a portion of each paycheck towards those important goals, whatever they may be. And the beauty of it is you get to decide what's important to you. So, you know, it's, it's totally in your control how you want to map that out. And one way you can start working towards those goals is just to have this idea in your mind that as a resident, you lived an okay life. And it's not like because overnight you make three or four times or more, you, you don't need to automatically adjust your lifestyle so that you have all of the nice things that you think goes along with having a six-figure income. It, because you don't probably need all of those things right now. So if you can convince yourself just to live a similar lifestyle to what you did while you were in training, for a few years at least, you can get yourself on a really good track to being able to accomplish some of your short-term goals and be well on your way to like moving towards your long-term goals too. So I've heard a lot of people talk about like, you live like a resident, you live like a resident. That's like something you hear all the time. And maybe you give yourself like a slight increase in, in what your take-home is, what your spending money is. But really a lot of that increased money should be going towards achieving those goals. And I think in the short term, it's really important to focus on kind of cleaning up the situation as it is. And some people are in a good spot when they come out of residency or when they come out of fellowship, but other people might have some credit card debt. You might have a lack of savings or, you know, a, a lack of any sort of cushion. So I would say that the first thing that you should prioritize is just getting yourself in a good kind of defensive position where you have some savings to fall back on if anything does happen and where you've eliminated any really high interest rate debt. And for some people, it might take a couple of months and they're done, you know, the first couple of paychecks and that's accomplished. For other people, it might take a year or longer. But I think that is really important because that puts you in a good position to be able to achieve your long-term goals too. Like if you are taking care of the short-term things that are eating away at your finances, then you're in a much better place to start saving for retirement and, and building some, some adequate pieces outside of that. And just because you have to live like a resident for a little while, or you're choosing to live like a resident for a little while, doesn't mean that you're never going to be able to increase your lifestyle. Like that will happen. And ideally, we can make that happen somewhat incrementally. Like we're not doing it overnight. We're not flipping a switch where all of a sudden you drive a fancy car and you have a bigger house like hopefully we can just do it a little bit at a time and make sure we're taking care of some of these other pieces of the financial picture before all of that kicks in because once you start making those lifestyle changes we've talked about this before too but it's really hard to dial it back like you're not wanna, going to want to get to a point where you have all of the nice things that you want and then realize you're not on track to have enough money in retirement and then choose to dial back so you can save more like that that's really difficult to do. So try to get yourself in a good position right off the bat. Absolutely. The whole pay yourself first mentality, you know, rather than quickly jumping up and giving money to other people like, you know, a bank for a mortgage, a car dealership, uh, you know, a department store for some clothes, Amazon, whatever your, your, your thing is. Um, you know, really focus on what's getting back to the goals and priorities. What's important to you? Let's make sure we're we're putting enough resources towards those priorities, and then we can upgrade the lifestyle with what's left. Um, but getting getting yourself set up to achieve financial success uh, for those important things is is crucial early on. And like Rochelle said, you will be able to upgrade the lifestyle. We promise you that. A good example I have. Um, from from someone I was talking to recently, um, doctors recently in practice, and they really didn't change their lifestyle at all when they entered practice. Um, and within the first two years, roughly, they paid off over three hundred thousand dollars in student loans. And that's you know, if you do the the rough back back of the napkin math, we're talking you know probably close to the equivalent of fifteen thousand a month going out the door towards student loan payments. You know, it didn't all come at once. They would put bonus money towards that and whatnot. But you know, a pretty significant chunk of change over a couple of years, and now you know we've got that hole. Out, you know, we're, we're out of the debt hole, and looking at other important things that we want to do. And, and one of the, the dreams he's always had is to drive a Tesla. And what do you know? You can afford it now. 
Um, we don't have that student loan burden anymore. We're putting enough towards the other financial goals like retirement and college savings and go nuts with what's left. Have fun. You know, we, we, you deserve it if you're in a position to afford it and your other stuff is on track. I think the student loans are a really important piece of the picture just to talk about and focus on a little bit. Um, if you don't have student loans, maybe fast forward two or three minutes and don't tell your friends. But if you do have student loans, I think just having a game plan in place will make you feel so much better. And it might not be a game plan where you pay it off over two or three years. That might be impossible depending on what your student loan burden is. But if you have a plan with an end date, like you will feel so much better about where your financial situation is at and it will be in a better position. So there are a lot of different options and we've kind of talked about student loans a little bit separately. So if you ever want to listen to an entire podcast episode on public service loan forgiveness, you can do that. But when we want to like hone in on how we're going to approach the student loans, there are a few main options. One of them is that public service loan forgiveness program. So if you're working in academic medicine, that may be the best fit for you. So just make sure that you are crossing your T's and dotting your I's and doing everything you need to do and have an end date in mind. Like when is my expected payoff time for this? If you're gonna remain in that income driven plan, understand that your payment's gonna go up pretty dramatically and you should be able to do some back of the napkin math to kind of figure out what that full payment will be over the next couple of years. So be prepared for that to get into your budget because it doesn't happen right away. So I think that lures people into a false sense of like having a little bit of extra money when they're on those income driven plans because your higher payment doesn't kick in right away. So you feel like you have extra cash flow, but you need to plan for that payment to go up dramatically. Um, and then the other thing that like if you don't qualify for public service loan forgiveness, if you work for a private employer, it may make sense to refinance your student loans. Definitely something that we want to move very carefully with because private banks are a lot less flexible than the federal government is but it could potentially save you a lot of money over the life of your loan. It's also going to give you like a very specific payment amount and it's going to give you a very specific payoff date too. If you choose a 10 year loan, that's how long you know you may have to pay unless you put extra towards them. So having a game plan in mind, having a specific payment in mind, you know that you're allocating that money towards your student loans, like can give you a lot more of a sense of security. And the ideally like the faster the better because it's going to give you a lot more flexibility to do other things in your plan when they're gone but for some people it may take quite a while to, to accomplish that depending on how large your student loan burden is yeah yeah i think yeah that big thing just are we going to stick with the federal loan system for either pslf or just the flexibility it offers or are we going to try and lower our interest rate a little bit by refinancing through a private lender. That's kind of the big dilemma pretty much everyone will face when they get into practice. And it really depends on the job setting and the capabilities that you have with cash flow to afford those payments. But like Rochelle, you were mentioning um, the you know, your loan payment staggering up when you're a lot of people will just use a tax return to prove income for their loan payment certification with the income driven payments. And so when you get into practice, if you recertify that summer you're, and, and you're submitting a tax return based on the previous year, that's still based on your residency income. So your payment's probably not going to change at all. Year two in practice, you've had half the year in training and up to half the year in practice. So your income is kind of a, a half a half and half of, of, a, of an attending and resident level. So your payment will jump up a little bit. And then your second year in practice, previous year was your first full calendar year at that attending level income and that's you know will drive your payment up even further so it's really not until your third year in practice if you're using your tax returns to prove income that your payment will be at its highest level so and you can do on the the federal loan um or the, the government student loan website i think it's just studentloan.gov um, they have a really useful payment estimator where you can even get as detailed as you're entering your specific loans or you can just use round numbers and estimate um, you know, based on your income and family and what state you live in. It'll tell you with the different payment plans approximately what your full monthly payment will be so you can plan ahead. Right now you might only be paying 300 a month, but you know it's going to jump up to 2,600 a month once, you, once your full salary is factored into the equation. So you can plan ahead for that. 
Absolutely. Yep. And there are a couple of other strategies that I've seen physicians use, like applying for NIH grants and, um, you know, primary care grants and things like that. And so if, if that's an option for you, definitely worth exploring. Um, you know, no stone unturned for sure when it comes to the student loans. And so anything that you can do to help offset those is great. But at the end of the day, like you're going to have to get rid of them one way or another. We can't just keep them around forever. And you don't want to do that either. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, I think the other big thing that comes up with people, and not always, but a lot of the time, is that the second people transition into practice, or a lot of my clients anyway, they, they want to buy a house. You know, they have been in training and it's kind of transitory in some ways, like you don't know where you're going to be, but when you end up lining up that first attending job, it's like, okay, this is, this is a commitment. I'm going to stay here for a while. And so now you feel like you're ready to buy a house. And I think in some ways, sure, like this, this might be a good time, but it's probably not in a lot of other ways. Like there are so many people, it's, it's very, very unlikely that your first job is going to be your forever job. People change jobs. Like this half of you will probably not be with that employer in three years. And when we think about home buying, like we want that to be a fairly significant commitment as far as how much time you're going to spend there. Because if you try to buy a house and then sell it two years later, the chances of you coming out ahead are very, very, very small. Like ideally we have five years or so at least to stay in a home and kind of recoup some of the costs that go into buying and selling. And the other thing is that like that can be a really big commitment on your monthly budget, depending on the size of the house that you're looking at. And if it is automatically putting you in a position where a huge portion of your cash flow is going towards a mortgage, then you're not going to be able to do the other things you want to do. Uh, you're not going to be able to pay off your student loans quickly. You're not going to be able to save enough for retirement. So we really don't want to bite off more than we can chew in that situation. Yeah, I've mentioned numerous times before in I think podcasts and blogs specifically, and just with clients of mine, really would prefer you keep your housing payment, whether it's a mortgage plus property taxes and interest or home insurance and everything, or rent, keep that below 20% of your income. Um, that'll, in most cases, make it somewhat affordable for you guys and still allow you to accomplish the other goals that you have in mind, case by case for everyone. Some people with no student loans and no plans for kids might be able to afford more house, but other might who have larger student loan balances, more obligations may not be able to even go up that high. Um, Twenty percent is a lot less than what a bank will approve you for, just to for you know your information. Um, but we've done the math enough times, we've seen enough people's finances, we found that's kind of that threshold to where you can still accomplish your other important goals too. Um, and and the transaction costs with real estate are obnoxious for anyone who's bought or sold a house before you know what i'm talking about um but that's where we say you really want to make sure you're committing to that home for at least a handful of years just to break even because when you factor in all the closing fees taxes um, the real estate agent costs when you sell like it takes a while just to break even um, and that's assuming your house maybe appreciates in value which isn't guaranteed. So if you're buying a home right away, using one of those doctor loans with a zero or 5% down payment, and then you hate your job, you need to go take a job elsewhere, and you need to sell it in a year or two, that's gonna be tough. You're gonna have to pay money most likely to get out of that house, uh, which is never fun. So really um, take it slowly. We know everyone wants to own a home, it's the American dream, but take it slowly, make sure that this is where we want to be um, and we're going to be here you know, for the foreseeable future before we make that commitment because that's, that's a pretty sizable commitment. Yeah as far as like the bank lending the only thing that they care about is that you can make your mortgage payment. They don't care about any of your long-term goals about college savings or retirement or anything like that like they're not in the business of making sure that you're okay when you're 60. So <laughs> just keep that yes. in mind. And I think that's yeah, or your kid. Like, I mean, <laughs> that's terrible, but yeah. Um, I think it's the one other thing that we want to talk about definitely today is that retirement piece. Like most people, because of extended time and training, you're playing catch up a little bit. So there's a lot of savings that you need to do in order to be in a good position to retire at an age 
when you want to retire and also to be able to maintain your lifestyle. Because the goal is not to get to retirement and then have to cut back because we want to make sure we have enough money. Like that's not the goal at all. So in general, when we're working with people that are just getting into their, their first job out of training, we encourage them to try to save at least 20% or maybe even more of their income for retirement. Um, and that does a couple of things. It allows you to play a little bit of catch up to save more because obviously we haven't been able to save quite as much as we would probably have hoped over the last 10 years. But it also gets you all used to living on a little bit less of your income. Like we, it helps to control that lifestyle increase if you're saving a good chunk of money. And we want to make sure that we're doing it strategically as well. So we're not just throwing money in the stock market and seeing what happens. Like we want to make sure that you're saving into those tax advantage accounts. So if you have an employer plan that's available to you, there's a lot of tax advantages to those. There's tax advantages to things like Roth IRAs, which might be a little bit more difficult to fund or maybe even impossible, depending on your income. But definitely something worth exploring, like with an advisor or a CPA, just to see what you can do there. Um, and then beyond that, 20% is a pretty big number of a high income. So you may have to do some additional savings outside of that too, um, like just setting up a general investment account. And when we're looking at these numbers, we're also looking at everyone's income. Like it's your household income. It's you, it's your partner, if you have a partner. And that's it's 20% of that gross number. And that probably will be a big number, but do the math, figure out what it is and what you need to be saving per month. And just have that in your mind as a benchmark. And then you can kind of reverse solve around like, what are your goals? And you can look at it in more detail also. But I think that's just a good number to have in your mind. Yeah, it's a great starting point. You know, for most physicians, you're really not getting your first real jobs until your early to mid 30s, some exceptions. Um, and most of you, therefore, aren't really starting your retirement savings until your early to mid 30s. Some people get it going early in training, but uh, for most of you, it's, it's, you know, we're not starting until our 30s. If you don't want to work until you're in your 70s, this is what's going to help get you on that right track to achieve financial independence. You don't have to quit working when you're in your early or mid 60s. You can work as long as you want, but we want to set you up so that you have the option to very least scale back if you don't like working full time. I think statistically, the average person in America retires around age 62, I want to say. Um, depending on which source you look at, it might be 62, 63. But a lot of people are forced to retire earlier than they would like um, you know, due to health reasons, due to whatever the case may be. I mean, right now we've seen with this whole COVID pandemic, um, a lot of practices and hospitals are basically forcing out their older physicians. They're saying, oh, you, you, you've told us you plan on retiring in the next year or two. Well, how about now? Because we can't afford to pay everyone. So you're the, the easiest one to put on the chopping block you're closest to the finish line. Um, so you, you might be forced out uh, for whatever reason sooner than you would like. So setting yourself up for success so that you have the option to scale back. And everyone's situation is different. You know, when you want to retire, what you want your lifestyle to look like will make will, will require you to save a potentially different amount. How, how comfortable you are with investment risk, you, know, you may need to save more or less based on that. Um, but that 20% benchmark is a good starting point to to get you going. So with that, you know, that first paycheck in practice, reward yourself, take it to Vegas, have some fun with it. You know, but that second paycheck and beyond, let's start taking 20% of it and directing it towards that financial independence goal. Absolutely. Yep. And there are a few other just random things that I think it makes a lot of sense to, to pay attention to during that transition time, like insurance items and estate planning and things like that. Um, with your insurances, if you already have disability insurance, good job, you should, but it may not be enough to protect like all of the income that you are making as an attending. So it's going to make sense to look at that and see if you need some additional coverage to protect all of your income. Because right now, chances are early on in your career, you need all of your income to achieve all the goals that we're talking about. Like This sounds like a lot of stuff because it is like paying off your student loans and, you know, planning for a house and college savings if, if you've got kids and all a saving for retirement. That's all a lot. That takes a lot. And so obviously we're planning around having your full income at this point. So we need to protect your full income at this point. 
the other thing is with life insurance, like everyone has life changes too. So it may be that you have life insurance already. If you do, it probably makes sense just to revisit it, see if it's adequate, see if the term length is long enough, if it's term life insurance that expires at some point, let's just make sure it's not expiring before you want it to. Um, if you are taking on a bigger mortgage or you've decided to have a kid, like all of that stuff kind of changes those needs. So we want to make sure that we're at least revisiting it and talking about it. The one other big thing that I want everyone to pay attention to, especially on their contracts, is malpractice insurance. So obviously we want to make sure we have adequate coverage. We also want to make sure that we know who is responsible for something called tail coverage. And I don't know if everyone knows exactly what that is, but basically the insurance that you have for your employer will generally protect you while you are employed there. But once you separate from that employer, there's something called tail coverage that has to be purchased that extends that coverage so that if something comes up after you leave, then we have some coverage that protects us from that. So in your contract, a lot of times it'll specify, like if you stay here for X number of years, we'll take care of it. But if you leave before then, then you're gonna be responsible for paying for that additional coverage. So just make sure you understand who is responsible at what point. And if it's you at any point, try to get an idea of what that number is, because it can be quite a bit of money. It can be very expensive. Do you have anything else to add there, Corey? No, I think just, yeah, knowing what you're responsible for, looking at the contract. Most employers now, especially if you're working at a hospital or a really large private group, um, they're most likely going to pay for your malpractice and tail coverage. But you know, check the contract, see what you're responsible for, especially if you're joining a smaller practice or if you're starting your own practice. Um, obviously, you're going to have to get your own malpractice at that point. And, and just knowing what you're responsible for so you're aware. Um, and it could be a good negotiating point in your contract negotiations too. Um, so that could be something. I think the big one is, yeah, you were, you touched on life and, and DI. Most of you are going to need to increase your disability insurance. The, if you don't already have a policy, if you don't have a policy, get it, um, before you graduate because you could potentially get some discounts while you're in residency or fellowship. Once you become an attending, those are harder to come by. Um, and then a typical resident or, or fellow policy will cover a five or six thousand dollar monthly benefit. Most of you are going to be living on more than five or six thousand a month once you're in practice, whether you uh, want to admit it or not. Um, so we're probably going to need to bump up that income protection. Even if your employer provides you some coverage, it's probably not going to be enough uh, to cover all of your income and you know, the employer plans are usually pretty limited. So it behooves you to try and maximize what you can get outside of work so you're not dependent on your employer and not all employers offer disability coverage anyways so um, really try and take that one into your own hands we talked about that on our recent disability insurance podcast so go back and listen to that one if you need some more info on disability insurance yeah and i think another thing just kind of a checklist item thing is making sure that you have an estate plan in place so even if you're a single person just having like a will and some um, like end of life things in place, or if you're incapacitated for some reason, having like a medical, what is, what is it called again, Corey? <laughs> powers of attorney, <laughs> healthcare, yeah, exactly. advanced directives. Yeah, I'm, I mean, you guys are doctors, you see scary things happen, but we just want to make sure that if anything happens to you, there's someone that's available to make decisions for you. Um, and, and I think that's really important. If you have children or a family, it's even more important because like that is the, the document where you determine like who, who takes care of my kids if I'm not around, if my, if my partner's not around. Um, and so like I think, sure, it makes sense to be able to set up beneficiaries and things like that in a will, but there's, there are other pieces that are even more important that are applicable even if you don't have a lot of assets. Yeah. Absolutely. And you can set it up to plan ahead for future children, too, if you want to just be proactive at this stage. Um, go listen to our estate planning episode. We, there's a lot of good in, insights there on estate planning. would definitely encourage you to meet with an attorney to get that taken care of, not one of those online do-it-yourself uh, programs, because you don't know what you don't know. And, and you're only capable of doing what you're knowledgeable about. Um, and when it comes to estate planning, most people outside of estate planning attorneys are not super knowledgeable. 
about the subject, so hard to, to complete those do-it-yourself templates without proper knowledge. And I think we might have mentioned it earlier, but just in case, an emergency fund, that's even more prevalent now in 2020. You just, who knows what, what might happen where you need some access to cash. You never know if your job is going to be 100% secure, if you're going to have to take a pay cut, if there's unexpected expenses that pop up. So having an adequate emergency reserve, ideally a minimum of three to six months worth of living expenses set aside, but whatever uh, makes you sleep well at night uh, is appropriate there. So I think those are the main things. Um, you know, we could obviously go more in depth on a lot of this stuff, but at least gives you a good starting point for when you make that transition and start earning those big kid paychecks. Yeah, and I think just order of operations wise, like let's build up some savings, pay off any bad debt, and by bad we mean high interest rates. Let's say seven percent or higher. Let's get credit rid of that. Cards, yeah, personal credit cards, loans. personal loans, furniture stuff, like anything like that. Let's just get rid of it, and then let's focus in on getting a long term game plan in place for the student loans and retirement savings, and revisiting things like insurances and the will, and you know if you want to buy a house, making a game plan for that too. Yeah. So having a plan in place, it doesn't have to be the most detailed plan, but just mm -hmm. a, a, a some loose plan in place for how to how you're going to accomplish your goals. It's a lot easier to get where you want to go if you've got uh, a map or, or a, a, an itinerary of how you're going to get there. So what road are you going to take? Um, roughly how long is it going to take? Uh, you know, what are what are the resources you're going to devote to it? and have that preferably written down so you can refer back to it if need be. And just the more you can set it on autopilot, the better. So automate as many things as you can. Automatic deposits to your investments, to your debts. Um, the more you can automate, the, the more idiot proof it is. Mm -hmm. Automatic transfer to a savings account, yep. <laughs> all that kind of stuff, absolutely. And don't feel like you're setting a, a, a plan in stone. Like we're not, we're not doing that. If you need to revisit it, you can make changes in the future. So I think that's one thing that that catches people once in a while is they feel like they can't commit to something in particular. Well, you can change it later if you need to. So don't worry too much about that. Absolutely, none of this stuff is permanent. I mean, the house part is probably the most permanent thing that we've talked about here. Um, you know, the, the hardest to adjust or get out of if you regret the decision, but. Uh, I'll tell people with retirement plans at work all the time, hey, just get enrolled, start maxing it out. I know it might feel like a, a lot that you're putting in there, but if it is too much, you can always go change it. You can lower the contribution rate if you find that you're putting more than you can afford in. So the hardest part is just pushing the button on the on the keyboard to, to say okay. So just try it, rip the Band-Aid off. You can always put the Band-Aid back on if you have to. So. Mm -hmm easy to adjust and that's where review meetings are important you know we we really try and pin our clients down at least a couple times a year to make sure that we're reviewing the overall plan accounting for any changes that occur so just preventative maintenance treat it like going to the dentist just twice a year once a year at a minimum revisit your financial goals how you're on track to achieving those goals and, and adjust things if needed along the way mm -hmm. For all of you that are getting started in that first like big kid job, congratulations. I'm sure it's really exciting and a little bit scary, but it's going to be great. Yes. Enjoy. Good luck. Talk to you again next time. We would love to hear your feedback and suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing podcast at thefinitygroup.com or by following Finity Group on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Finity Group LLC. You can follow me on Twitter at Corey Janoff CFP, Instagram at Corey Janoff, or on LinkedIn under my name, Corey Janoff. You can follow me on Twitter at Rochelle Finance or on Instagram, Vanderzanden Rochelle, or on LinkedIn under my name, Rochelle Vanderzanden. Check out all of the podcast episodes on the affinitygroup.com slash podcast on our Finity Group YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to check out our Financial Clarity blog at theaffinitygroup.com slash blog. Thanks for listening to this episode of Financial Clarity for Doctors by Finity Group, LLC.